Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. This presentation is going to cover the complex world of server storage. There are some important takeaways as we delve into the subject of server storage. One, the more advanced the storage, the more complex it gets. There is no cheap server storage solutions. They're all expensive. InfiniBand with NVMe is the king of speed concerning server storage. Latency is the enemy of storage. So if I have, well, let's say I have a 10 gigabit connection to a storage solution and I have another 10 gigabit connection to a server storage. This has one millisecond of latency. This has a hundred milliseconds of latency. This application is going to run much, much better. This one, even though they're both 10 gig connections, the latency rules the day. NVMe is radically forcing changes in enterprise and data center storage. HP and Dell and a lot of small storage vendors offer some incredible storage options, but at mind numbing prices. Storage technologies have a complex set of connectors, cables, terminology, making it a very tough subject to learn. If you want to learn a lot about storage, go to Sina.org. Two important drivers in storage speed are one, we're decoupling servers from the storage they need. We've got massive servers with virtual machines and containers on them, but their storage is somewhere else. And two, enterprise apps are demanding more and more performance. That is demanding more and more storage speed. Enterprise applications are driving faster, but more expanding storage. ERP applications, databases, CRM applications, real-time analytics, productivity applications, and collaboration apps. The two massive problems facing server admins are massive storage data needs, petabytes, and faster storage hardware subsystems. We would like everything to be like direct attached storage or DAS. This year alone, over 56% of IT organizations have over one petabyte of data versus only 23% in 2017. When it comes to server storage, get ready to spend some serious cash. When we look at PCs, laptops, and servers, we break all their hardware down into subsystems. Now, the only thing that I don't have showing here is GPU, which is very important in laptops and desktops. It's growing and it's important in servers, but just for now, we'll ignore GPU. We have the network subsystem, we have our CPU, memory, we have storage. Each of these play a very, very important role in the performance of your hardware. Now, I said storage is expensive, but this is about as cheap a storage appliance as you will ever look upon. This is a 1U storage rack. It holds about 34 3.5 inch up to 14 terabyte hard drives. That would give you a total capacity of about 476 terabytes. This type of storage unit is often used by Google for your Gmail, for your Google Drive, for your Google Photos. Facebook uses these type of storage appliances. And Microsoft, for their ConsumerOutlook.com, they use these types of storage appliances. This is as cheap as you're going to go. You can go to almost any server vendor and customize a 2U rack server. And with a few clicks of a mouse, you can put two AMD Epic CPUs, each with 64 cores in each processor, 128 gigs of RAM, a SAS RAID controller, 24 1.8 terabyte hard drives, and you can end up with a $48,000 dragster engine. This is enormous amount of compute horsepower. 
Now, many servers allow what's called expanding DAS or direct attached storage. Take a look at the picture in the center. I've got a server down below, but it's got limited amount of storage drives. But with this particular model, I can add an enclosure that I can stack on top up to 96 hard drives. I can put them on the top or below the server. And if you look on the right hand side, you can see how I can take a SAS external connector and cables and daisy chain those servers and storage enclosures together. Some vendors support up to 240 hard drives. That's a lot of storage. They're very fast and they have very low latency. Problem with this is it's got plenty of storage, it's fast, low latency, but it's a single point of failure. Anything goes wrong in this chain, the application comes down. So you've got over $100,000 invested in this server storage scenario and you still have a single point of failure. This makes any server administrator not sleep well at night. Now take a look at this architecture. This is a classic application design. I've got two virtual servers that are running, say, an Exchange application. I also have two passive servers that are running an Exchange, but they are passive right now. Between them is a network connection that's basically a heartbeat connection. Then below, I've got on each site a shared pool of storage, a network connection between those shared pools of storage that replicates and keeps the data consistent and the same. If my active exchange servers die, the heartbeat fires up the two passive servers and my serp my application never goes down. This provides me shared storage, failover, and redundancy. With this design, your network administrator can go to sleep at night. The simplest definition of a storage area network is a shared or pooled set of storage that's used by more than one server. When you remove your storage away from your servers, you have to design the network between them very carefully. For example, a standard Ethernet switch can add too much latency between your server and your storage. If you're connecting a network card to your server that's going to connect to the storage, you need a 25 to 50 gigabyte network card to connect you to your storage. Network bandwidth is very important, especially as we get into NVMe storage arrays. Take a look at my chart on the left. If I have one NVMe hard drive and I'm transferring data across the network, I need at least three gigabits of bandwidth to transfer that data. If I've got two NVMe that are transferring data across the network, I need at least six gigs. If I've got a storage array and I've got four NVMe hard drives transferring data across the network, I need at least 12 gigs of bandwidth to have that happen. If I've got a 10 gigabit NIC on my right, I'm going to have a bottleneck. When I move my storage remotely, I have to consider my network cards, my cables, my switches, everything between the server and the storage has to be thoughtfully designed. As you start looking at storage, you begin to see the term HBA. What is an HBA? Now, HBA stands for Host Bus Adapter. Now, if you have InfiniBand, it's called HCA, or Host Channel Adapter. HBA is simply a storage controller. Most PCs and laptops, you don't add HBAs because it's built into the south bridge of every desktop and laptop. You have a storage controller already. But in servers, they often only come with, say, a SATA controller, which no one uses, and you have to buy these HBAs, or storage controllers, for whatever scenario you're going to use for your storage. Now, if you have a server that you're going to use direct attached storage, you may purchase an optional SAS controller and you'll always, almost always want RAID functionality with that SAS controller, such as this Broadcom Mega RAID 9500 series. This runs about $1,000 for this HBA or storage controller with RAID. You can run probably 95 to a 240 hard drives off that controller. Now, if your server is going to connect to a fiber channel storage area network, you're going to need an FC storage controller, such as this Dell Sandblade has two ports, runs about $1,400. Now, if you've got a very powerful server, you've got virtual machines, you've got containers, and you're going to connect to remote storage, you may have to purchase two of these, maybe even three of these HBAs to give the bandwidth that you need to your storage. If your server is going to connect to an InfiniBand storage area network, you're going to have an HCA controller, 
such as this Mellanox 200 gigabit PCI 4.0 16 lane. This runs about $1,652. Again, depending on what you have running on the server and what you need for storage, you may need two of these controllers to get the bandwidth you need to your storage. Now, if your server is connected to an iSCSI storage, you're going to need an iOS iSCSI controller adapter. There's a Dell 10 gig iSCSI controller and it runs about three grand. Now, this is interesting. Windows 10 and 11 have a free iSCSI controller built in. It's called an initiator. Windows Server also contains the same software, but a lot of times that's going to take CPU time in order to do that same feature via software. So many people choose to add the hardware controller to offload their CPU, let the controller do the iSCSI work, free up their CPU. Now, if your server is connecting to a NAS storage, network attached storage, you don't need a controller. You just need a good NIC because the NAS device will have a storage controller built into the NAS device. Now, if I want to launch my iSCSI IO controller that's software on my Windows 11 or Windows 10, I go to my start menu at the search bar. I'm going to just type in iSCSI. Notice it pops up and shows me the iSCSI Initiator app. So I'm going to open that. And this application is going to allow me to connect with the proper information, the IP address of my storage array, my iSCSI target. They call that a target. That's got all my hard drives on it. So I can put in the IP address and it will connect this Windows 11 to that remote storage array. So when we start removing our storage away from our servers, one of the nice features of that is that it's more expensive expandable. We can choose different kinds of networks to put between our server and our storage, such as fiber channel, ethernet, or InfiniBand. The most simplest definition of a storage area network, which is remote storage, is that it is storage that can be used by more than one server and applications. It's very resilient to failure. We have to be careful about adding latency in that network, make sure that we have plenty of bandwidth, and it is much more complex to manage that storage. And it's very expensive. When you put your servers and your storage apart remotely, you're going to choose a couple networks. You're going to use InfiniBand network, Fiber Channel network, or Ethernet. Storage admins call these networks fabrics. So here's an example of HP's Ethernet storage fabric. They've got their servers here. They've got their storage over here. They choose very carefully NICs, switches. Everything is chosen carefully to get the highest bandwidth, the lowest latency. Storage fabrics also include protocols. Here's the OSI layer of InfiniBand, and it looks very different than what is happening in traditional Ethernet. Here is an InfiniBand fabric where we have our servers, our storage, our switch switches and the cables, connectors that make InfiniBand. InfiniBand is the choice for very high bandwidth and very, very low latency. Fiber Channel is one of the most popular networks to put between your servers and your storage. Fiber Channel is well established in the enterprise. It's fast. It does require more skills for the network administrator. It's complex. It requires special switches that build redundancy. Typically, most storage area networks use Fiber Channel. Here's a great picture that shows who is supporting Fiber Channel. We see the various operating systems, various server vendors, what companies build the host adapters, Fiber Channel switching, and the disk flash storage array systems for Fiber Channel. Now we can also choose to connect our servers to storage using Ethernet. Ethernet is growing in its popularity between servers and storage. You have to watch out for latency with Ethernet. It's fast. iSCSI uses Ethernet. Fiber channel can be run on top of Ethernet. There's a protocol called NVMe over TCP. There's also remote DMA, which we'll talk about a little bit later, over converged Ethernet. It's definitely cheaper to build a network with Ethernet, but you have to watch out using standard switches because of latency. If you use iSCSI, iSCSI commands are encapsulated in an Ethernet frame. They're actually routable. You can send them across the WAN. Fiber channel over Ethernet, fiber channel frame is encapsulated in the payload of the Ethernet. It's not routable 
local. It works well on a local area network. You can also use CAN network adapters, converged network adapters that have both fiber channel driver and a ethernet driver. Common types of remote storage are NAS. Typically they're slower and less expandable. They typically depend on Linux file systems and RAID. Then we have the storage area network. They're complex, they're failover, they're resilience, they're expensive, they're expandable. And then you also have storage as a service. You can go to Google for cloud storage, AWS, Azure, and many more. Remember, in the world of storage, speed is the key. And one of the technologies that's happening in server storage is RDMA, the ability of an application on a server to transfer data to an application on another server without the use of the CPU or the operating system. This is called RDMA. When I can take data from one application and push it across the network to another application without the CPU and without intervention of my operating system, I get speed. So RDMA is very attractive to many developer and applications. So let's take a look at server storage media. First, SATA drives. They're still used in servers. They're cheap. They're slow. They have huge storage capacity, which is why we're still using them. They're very good for archival storage. They need either hardware RAID or software RAID. 3.5 inch is the preferred form factor on server storage. Think of SATA moving data on and off as a two lane highway. It doesn't have the best transfer rate. SAS drives are very popular on servers. They have medium performance. They're very expensive. They only have medium storage capacity, nowhere near what you can do with SATA. They can run as high as 15,000 RPM. They have a lot of problems with heat and power dissipation. They either need hardware RAID or software RAID, and their preferred form factor is 2.5, not 3.5. Think of SAS as like a four-lane highway. If you haven't been up on RAID, I've got three videos that I'm showing you right now. You can take a look on my channel. They will bring you up to speed on a lot of basic RAID concepts. Now, of course, another storage media is NVMe. They're expensive, they're fast, they have relatively low storage capacity, very low power and heat dissipation. RAID can boost their performance almost to the point of RAM speeds. Many enterprise form factors are used. M.2 is not used for servers. It's a consumer form factor. Think of NVMe as a 12-lane highway. This is a nice little chart that allows you to see the different kinds of media and their latency at the high end, their latency at the low end, and then IOPS, which is input output operations per second, here on the very right hand column. You can look at hard drives, solid state hard drives, NVMe, and there at the bottom is one that's called PM or persistent memory. When flash gets as fast as dim RAM, which is what Intel is doing with their Optane flash memory, you begin to see the latency down at the very bottom. You see the PM row, persistent memory. You can begin to see latency and our input output operations per second. Now, when enterprise uses NVMe, they typically use many other types of form factors. If you look on the bottom, we see the M.2, which is typically what we put in our desktops and laptops. Enterprises don't want to use those because they need more heat dissipation, more memory capacity, so they have a tendency to use these other form factors in their storage arrays. Now, the last storage media that we're going to talk about is something that's recent. It's called Ethernet SSDs. And basically, we're going to take an SSD and directly connect it to a 10 gig switch port. We're going to use open source storage management software. There's no single point of failure. It's expandable and we can get massive storage capability. This is an enclosure for Ethernet SSDs, and it basically provides power and cooling and a direct connection to a 10 gig Ethernet switch port. Every drive gets a 10 gig port. We talked about how enterprise applications want fast storage. As storage latency goes down and the speed of storage goes up, we can begin to substitute it for memory. And that's exactly what Intel is doing with their Optane flash memory, is they're actually taking it and building what's known as persistent memory. 
Whenever you can get flash storage to reach near the speeds of DRAM chips, you can begin to take that storage and make it look and act like RAM, which is exactly what Intel is doing with their Optane flash memory. Another important concept in storing data in today's server environment is we can store that data in blocks, in files, or in objects. Now, block storage is simply, as it says, we're going to store data in blocks. Databases do this and typically storage area networks. File storage is very familiar to most of us. That's typically what we use on our operating systems in Windows and Linux. It's hierarchical in structure. We have folders. Network attached storage typically uses a file storage file system to store data on its storage arrays. Another way to store data is objects. It's a growing trend with container applications to use object storage. Now Azure calls it blobs. Go figure. Developers can use an, an HTTP API with any kind of client operating system or programming language. The cost structure means you only pay for what you use. Doing it this way, the developer does not have to worry about maintaining hard drives or RAID arrays. It's simply handled by the cloud provider, such as Google, AWS, or Azure. So what is Microsoft doing to address the issue of super expensive storage area networks and network attached storage arrays? Well, one, they're approaching it with Storage Spaces Direct. It shipped with Server 2016. This type of storage is highly available, it's scalable, it's software defined storage, and it's at a fraction of the cost of a typical SAN or NAS array. So how does this work? Well, first we're going to run a PowerShell to cluster these two servers together. Then there's a number of ways you can do it. You can take all the storage except that maybe the two hard drives that you have the operating system running on it or divvy up your storage however you want. But take whatever amount of storage you want on each server and dedicate that to Storage Space Direct. Now you can do that either through GUI or you can do it all through PowerShell. And you basically pool all that local storage together so that both servers can see it. Now once you have pooled all all that storage together, you can start carving up volumes and you can put virtual machines in those volumes or you can do whatever you want. The key to any of this type of storage space direct system, especially with standalone servers, is very, very fast Ethernet connectivity and low latency between the servers. Once you've created your volumes, you've assigned them to VMs or to ex extra storage, however you've done your storage. If you lose a disk, it doesn't matter. If you lose a server, it will still run. If you want to grow this, you can simply expand your storage, your local storage, if that server will support that, or throw in more servers into the cluster. Now, how complex and difficult is this to do? I watched Microsoft do this with three servers. It took them five minutes to build, very similar to what I just shared. I'll put a link below to the five-minute video that Microsoft demonstrates storage-based direct. Pretty impressive.